Yeah. So, uh, Dr. Tejas Dharia, he, uh, we have one common hospital where we work together, but I've never met him. Oh, I have, my patients have met him. Uh, Dr. Tejas, I think he, uh, you said you graduated from KM, MBBS. Then he did uh, his radiology MD in uh, Bangalore. Came back here, did his fellowship in interventional radiology <coughs> in KM Hospital and Tata Hospital. And uh, of course, now he's been practicing below the neck intervention essentially. And uh, I think he's, uh, we family physicians are jack of all trades. In interventional radiology, he's kind, uh, kind of a master of all trades and does many things from liver cancer. He's part of a liver transplant team uh, at uh, Jupiter or Global, Jupiter Hospital. And he does varicose veins and uh, he call, does his bread and butter biopsies, which are ultrasound or CT guided biopsies. So uh, a master in many trades. Uh, I'm, I'm very happy, sir, to have you, Tejas, here. Yeah. Thank you, thank you. Many of you already know him. Uh, let us begin. Uh, the first subject that we talk about is varicose veins. Uh, they just, uh, when should a patient with varicose veins get some intervention done? So basically, uh, varicose veins, varicose is a very chronic problem. Uh, it's not like a ajua or kal patient will come to you. They will try to pull on for many, for years actually. Uh, but when they come, that means they have either pain, swelling, there is some discoloration. Uh, varicosities are generally there, but they tend to avoid. It is when there is, because of this swelling, uh, in this varicosities, they develop like superficial thrombophlebitis. There is this varicosities, there is clotting and all that. That is when they will come to you and that is when we need to intervene. Uh, or obviously, venous ulcers is like extreme stage, but or any ruptured perforate uh, varicosity is when you need to intervene. So, uh, bleeding and ulcers are the Extreme. final things, yes, yes. but so even that before that, skin, dis skin discoloration, discoloration yes. pain, etc., you will yes. probably intervene uh, in… A lot so of edema. What are the options that a patient of varicose veins have and which option is better in which situation? So, uh, over the years, obviously surgical, surgery, surgery was done initially, but now nobody offers surgery. Uh, the options are either you do a laser or an RFA. Uh, or a vena seal injection, which is just a two-year-old uh, procedure, the vena seal. Laser and RFA are a decade-old procedure. We have five-year, ten-year results of it. Uh, and vena seal in which basically the process is that K, you puncture the great saphenous well, distal to the distal most per, uh, incompetent perforator, go up to the saphenofemoral junction, and two centimeters from the saphenofemoral junction, you start either ablating or you do uh, ablation with laser or with RFA or you inject the glue. Uh, the only thing is that ke if most of these patients, not only GSV ablation is, will not suffice, uh, they will have incompetent perforators. And if you want to do vena seal injection, then you cannot do glue injection on this, in these incompetent perforators because if this glue goes into the deeper system, very high risk of deep vein thrombosis. Uh, so in my opinion, uh, laser is a very good uh, uh, treatment option that we should offer to any of these patients because laser is a less bulkier system also. RFA is a bulkier system. So RFA goes through a six French sheath, which is like three to four millimeter sheath, whereas uh, laser will go through an 18 gauge needle. Uh, the laser thing, so that is the advantage. So we'll rewind a bit so that it becomes less technical for all of us. Uh, what he's saying is there is a new method called vena seal, vena seal, v e n a s e a l, which is glue, glue basically, based to be placed inside the varicosity to kind of shrink the whole thing or obstruct the whole thing. And glue is relatively new. Let us currently forget about the glue. It's a relative new method with very few indications. <clears throat> Let us go back to the standard method, which is laser ablation. Laser ablation is you ablate the whole dilated tortuous varicosity by laser. Uh, it can be done by laser or as he said, RFA. RFA is radio frequency ablation. You ablate the whole thing. He said you insert the catheter from below and go up to the saphenofemoral junction. So for that, what is the investigation prior to the thing that they will need to order 
uh, in uh, Doppler or whatever. Yeah. What so is the to Venus be done? Doppler? Basically, you order. Uh, advise a venous Doppler for varicose veins in which we need to know whether the great, uh, the saphenofemoral junction is incompetent, the saphenopopliteal junction is incompetent, how many there are incompetent perforators and varicosities are in there in which which areas. So this is if the patient doesn't have a venous ulcer. But if a patient has venous ulcer, venous ulcer will only happen if there are a lot of dilated varicosities and one of these varicosities is just below the skin which has actually slowly steadily because of the edema the skin becomes tender and you either itch in that area or the varicosities are ruptured and then it forms a venous ulcer so for that you need to know the incompetent perforator supplying the venous ulcer very important because you may ablate the entire GSV, patient will not benefit with that. You so, have to ablate the incompetent perforator. So just for going back to the basics of anatomy, when uh, you say that there is a saphenofemoral incompetence, incompetence. what do you mean? Saphenofemoral, in, see, normally blood goes from the great saphenous vein into the deep venous system, uh, our common femoral vein and everything. And there are valves. So wa what does this valve do? They only allow one way. Uh, uh, because of gravity, the blood when it goes up has to come down. So there are valves in these veins which prevent the downward uh, flow of the blood. But because of long-standing uh, professionals who have long-standing working hours like salesmen, postmen, traffic policemen, teachers, doctors, females very commonly post-pregnancy is because when their intra-abdominal pressure increases. Uh, you see this in athletes also because they tend to do a lot of abdominal exercise, they tend to tense their abdomen while they are doing lower body. So when this happens is, is that the pressure in the veins increases significantly and now the blood is going from the deep system into the superficial system. So the one way traffic from superficial to deep is disrupted when there is incompetence and you get deep to superficial uh, blood flow. And so that incompetence can be diagnosed on a so venous Doppler. Venous Doppler. So it's not like the valves are functioning poorly. It's basically because of that extra pressure into the superficial system, these veins become dilated. So the valves which were actually approximating initially, now they become uh, distant from... Oh, Mike, pass sorry. Over, sir. Uh, they uh, basically, they are distant from each other. So the valves are still working, but because they are not approximating, there is a reflux. So these patients will give classic symptoms. In the morning when I get up, I have no problem is because when they are sleeping, uh, the, the legs and the heart are in the same level. So the gravity is nullified. But in the morning, as the day progresses, they become, the legs become dependent. And when the legs become dependent, they, the venous pooling starts in the leg. And that is when you will start feeling that I have swelling. Predominantly, it starts from the ankle, goes up to the knee. So that is where if conservatively, if we have to manage, then stockings. What will the stockings do? Class 2 compression stocking having a pressure of around 30, 35 to 40 millimeters of mercury. The valves which are uh, apart, the stockings will bring them close. So whatever the reflux which is happening from in the superficial system, they will, that will reduce. And once that is reduced, uh, the swelling will reduce. So this will, these patients will benefit. Them. So when you said you look for the saphenofemoral incompetence or the popliteofemoral incompetence, and you look for incompetent perforators, perforators. Which, which are uh, which are all all along the yeah so it is between the superficial system and the deep system all along the, uh, the greater saphenous uh, along, along system. all along yeah but predominantly they are in the below knee region below knee region and all the imperforators have to be treated incompetent incompetent perforators, uh, perforators yes. have to be treated Madhab, ideally you have to treat because these are the incompetent perforators because of which patients generally have a lot of swelling correct uh, if you ablate the GSV, but still with this incompetent perforator, there may be few varicosities. So recurrence is common uh, if is, you yes. leave the incom incompetent perforators. perforators. And how do you treat the incompetent perforators? Laser ablation. With you just ablate. Laser. You just perforate, uh, puncture the incompetent perforator and you just ablate it uh, one uh, half a centimeter away from the deep system. So all this laser ablation is done under guidance of sonography. Right? Yes, and completely and the entire procedure done under sonography. And where would you do it? In the operation theatre? Yeah, in an OT is good enough because generally we do this procedure, I at least do this procedure under spinal anesthesia. One is that ke the procedure becomes pain free. Two is that when you give spinal, then there is a lot of vasodilatation in the lower. So in case there is 
some perforator because of the lying down you tend to miss this spinal will uh, help in that vasodilatation and it can improve the outcome of the procedure once treated what is the recurrence rate and what so, is the need for second uh, procedure so uh, i would say uh, 97 to 99% there is no uh, recurrence 1 to 3% there is rec chances of recurrence but uh, recurrence is not with the veins that we have ablated those veins are already closed it is the pressure of the deep system in one of these few newer in perforators or uh, there is an accessory gsv that can come up so that that is the reason after a laser procedure we generally tell the patients to wear stockings is to prevent the leakage from the deep system into any new system that can create again uh, recurrence how long will the how long be? three to six months then you, they don't need to wear then then i generally it depends on how how uh, so when we do a doppler uh, we I personally do my Dopplers because I need to also see whether there is deep venous reflux. Uh, what is deep venous reflux is? Basically, uh, when I say that there is reflux from the deep system into the superficial system, these patients will, the outcome is excellent with laser and all. But there is, what happens is because of long standing, there is now reflux into the deeper system also. That means the deep system, the common femoral vein, popliteal vein, they have also dilated and their valves are also not uh, uh, approximating each other. So there is reflux there. So in these patients, you generally tend to tell them that you might have to wear stockings lifelong, the below knee ones. Got it. Uh, what are the specific indications for radio frequency ablation? So laser and, uh, uh, and RFA, the indications are absolutely the same, same, same. absolutely same. Oh, it's only, so Venaseal also can be used, but uh, for incompetent perforators and all that, I don't recommend because chances of deep vein thrombosis is very high. Second thing is, when we are doing a laser or an RFA, the system is too small and the great saphenous vein is at least 5 to 6 millimeters. So we give peritumescent. What, when I say peritumescent is, uh, if you have to get a good circumferential ablation of the vein, the internal wall of the vein, so that it doesn't recanalize. Uh, you give injections all along the vein. And when you give injections all along the vein, you're trying to compress, compress In the injections vein. Injections of? Injection of normal saline with uh, soda bicarb and lignocaine. So the, it causes a little uh, soothing and less burning effect on the patient post process. So what he's saying is just to make it clear, we don't have an image here. He has put a uh, wire inside uh, which is going to ablate the vein the wire the distance between the wire and the wall of the vein there is distance uh, there is a uh, distance between them to put water or saline around that wire all along the vein is called peritumescence and this peritumescence helps in which way so it compresses the vein so when you ablate Basically, along all this, uh, one is that you get a good ablation, circumferential ablation of the vein. Two is that all along this vein, there is a, some nerve, uh, the nerva norvegina. So there can be, sometimes patient can have complaints of numbness. So all that uh, complications reduces significantly. Okay. Third is that obviously skin burns. Uh, because they are superficial varicosities, they are very close to the skin. So chances of skin burn are also reduced. Reduced by the peritumescence. Okay. What is the average duration of the whole procedure? Uh, for one leg, one hour at least. Only, Only the procedure with 15 minutes of spinal anesthesia, 45 minutes of the procedure. And post-procedure, we give them compression bandage uh, with uh, Gamgee and crepe bandage so that whatever peritumescent and whatever edema is there, all that will ooze out. And then and the compression stocking stays like if today morning we have done. So today full day till tomorrow morning overnight and then tomorrow morning patient takes a shower and then we give them compression stock. I'm sorry, I made a mistake. Peritumescence is outside the blood vessel, compressing the blood vessels. Yes, uh, is that right, right? Right, right. And all across the vessel, around the blood vessel, they will be injecting saline or a mixture of saline, soda bicarb, etc. And that will compress the vein, making it more accessible to the laser beam. Uh, what is the cost of the procedure, say, in uh, Nanavati Hospital? So Nanavati, uh, they charge MRP. So for one leg, it will cost around 1.5 to 
to 1.75. Whereas in a small 100 bedded small center, we can do it for like 1 lakh 10,000 to 1 lakh 20,000. One leg. One leg. Okay. But that will include together. Yes, yes. Both can be done. In fact, I generally recommend to do both of them together. Is because the pain and everything is finished in uh, a couple of weeks post procedure. S sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Obviously, the ca the cost comes down by the, for the second leg. It comes down by fifty percent. Is because the laser fiber, the laser fiber is the same only. So we can use it for both the procedures. After ablation, if they have a deep venous reflux, very important, sir. B deep venous reflux. I said no. The deep veins. If the deep veins have a reflux, reflux, incompetent valves within the deep system. Matlab, no, sir. But basically, uh, you have to tell them beforehand because these patients either they will have a lot of swelling, uh, they have recurrent cellulitis. Uh, so for that, you need to treat the basic cause, and then you tell them, okay. Huh. And now with uh, technology, now we have compression socks also. So it's not like stocking, stocking. You wear normal shoes like that. You have socks, like football socks, how people wear. They are like class two compression socks that are available. That are available in different colors. So people will never realize also. Sorry. So different companies make it. Uh, few of these companies are, Sigwar is, pe most of the people must be knowing. Uh, now there is one, Jobs and Relaxon. These are the three best companies that are jobs. J O B S T, jobs. Sorry. Okay, uh, sorry. Any questions related to varicose veins before I go to the next subject? So, uh, after the procedure, above the knee. And uh, then, if you want to just maintain, then below knee. I'll be repeating the question so that, you know, the yeah, other audience. Yeah, yeah. Huh? Are there any chances of getting, of getting? DVT. He's asking whether stockings used for a long time can predispose to DVT. So, so we say stockings to be worn only during daytime. Um, in the morning when you get up, take your shower, wear your stocking. In case you are sleeping for more than two hours in a day, then you have to remove the stockings. So chances of DVT are very less. Okay, and uh, you had Sagar? He's saying some patients complain of pain, itching due to stockings. So that is where, so when we recommend, matlab, anybody recommends, people just go, patients go at the chemist and they buy. And they buy those visco stockings. The visco stockings are very thick. They are not even class two compression stockings. So that is where with, in, with Mumbai weather, they can tend to have sweating and all. But now with what companies have said, they are pure cotton ones. So the chances of sweating and all that is less. Now if there is a patient who is a shopkeeper. So what I will tell them that, Ab ghar se pen ke mat jau, chalega. Dukan mein rakh lo. The minute you enter the shop, wear them. Where the minute to come out of the shop, remove them, hang them there and come out. Okay. So that way their compliance also improves significantly. So He's asking what are class 2 stockings? So class 2 is for varicose veins. Class 1 is for deep vein thrombosis. So if there is a patient who has deep vein thrombosis, and post any procedure or you don't want that patient to undergo post thrombotic syndrome then you give them class 1 stockings and you can keep them on oral anticoagulants for 6 months class 2 is, pre is for varicose veins so I first thing I said that only if there is a patient is asymptomatic as in just cosmetically he has varicosity and you don't want these varicosities to become into venous ulcers or into cellulitis or having deep vein refluxes, give them compression stockings, medically manage them. It's only when they come to you, matlab ke, there is a lot of discoloration, blackish discoloration, there is pain. No, no, no. Discoloration means there is, there is a lot of swelling around that area. And, they, and that patients tend to have a lot of itching. 
So then it, it hampers. In the morning hours they will not have a problem, but at the end of the day, in the night when they, are, they, uh, they go to sleep, you will always, uh, they will always complain that Raat ko bohat dard hota hai, sir. So that is where I uh, say that the initial Doppler is the most important, sir. Uh, whether there are whether the laser ablation, the perforators are ablated. Because if the perforators are not ablated, then that pre whatever the pressure was all along the great saphenous vein, now that pressure is only on those three perforators. So if you don't close them, that patient will definitely have pain in the below knee, around the ankle region. And if you touch them and you do a Doppler on the patient, it will absolutely correspond to an incompetent perforator and the pain Location. or a patch of discoloration. Uh, you were asking something, Dr. Vakharia. Name of the stocking again. So, Siguaris. Siguaris. Jobst. J-O-B-S-T. Jobst and Relaxan. R-E-L. A X S C double A N relax and relax R E L A X S double A N relax and yes class one class two above knee below knee class two is for class two is for varicose varicose. class one is for deep pain thrombosis. Yeah, you can do that. That is where I say ke if any patient is there, first thing is that ke they take a shower and immediately wear the stocking. So, you get up. In, not required. Where that? The Doppler will decide whether he has incompetent perforation. As Sir said, that if the patient is not symptomatic and still there is cosmetic problem, then you give them baloney. But if the patient has a lot of pain and the, on the Doppler, the saphenofemoral junction is incompetent, then you give them a bounty like that. So you can, uh, Daflon is a tablet, you can give them diosimin. Uh, but that is, I would, for me, if you give them patient long term da, uh, Daflon, uh, you tell them that you take for 15 days, one month, and then start wearing your stockings. So, and stop the uh, Daflon tablet. Because so, it is just a symptomatic relief that we are giving the patient. We are not giving a permanent solution when we give them oral medications or you give them compression stockings. No, no. So, they are useful. They increase the pumping capacity of the blood. But then, uh, if with compression stockings, then their effect reduces. So you tell them, uh, if they come today to you, give them for 15 days. Tell them that in the next week, buy the stocking. Get used to the stocking. And once, the, once you wear the stocking, stop the dap. Mm -hmm. Then stocking will do the purpose. Come. See, varicose veins, you know, when you treat them initially as medical management, it's more about patient compliance. Because patient has to wear the stockings, the most important thing. Uh, we'll go ahead. A patient comes to you, say a 30 year old male, uh, after a long flight has calf swelling, Doppler uh, shows deep vein thrombosis. Our standard treatment for that kind of a patient is anticoagulant therapy, uh, make sure that there is no pulmonary embolism and uh, continue the anticoagulant therapy for three to six months. There are interventions available for deep vein thrombosis. So uh, when do you intervene to remove the thrombus? So, uh, if a patient comes to you with uh, all of a sudden, sudden onset swelling of one of the limb uh, and which is increasing, so they will say that okay, th the last three days it was below the knee and now it is slowly, gradually increasing up to my thigh and it has become tense. The first investigation, see obviously when this patient comes, the first thing that you need to do is uh, feel the peripheral pulses. If the pulses are felt, that means you are ruling out an arterial component. Then comes the venous component. So if a venous component, a Doppler study is the first thing that you need to ask a venous Doppler to rule out deep vein thrombosis. Uh, now, uh, yes, uh, when a patient comes, what you do, you give them injection clexane subcutaneously 
depending on the weight, but our standard Indian uh, person is around 60 kgs. So 0.6 milligram BD subcutaneously for five days. And then on the fifth day, you start them on any oral medications, either Zeralto or Rivaroxabine or any of these newer ones or Warfarin if cost is a effective thing, uh, cost is a component. But what we have to offer is, these patients, it is like, you know, when you give them oral medication, there is chances that the clot might not dissolve. And then eventually the patient will develop post-thrombotic syndrome. That means the deep venous system is blocked and then the pressure is coming out through the superficial system. Pain, swelling, varicose veins, discoloration. So what we have to offer is, is we, uh, and there is a risk of pulmonary embolism. So we put an IVC filter first and we do catheter-directed thrombolysis in which, uh, so if a patient has left lower limb DVT we, and the right lower limb is absolutely fine, we put a filter through the right femoral uh, vein in the infrarenal IVC and then we make the patient prone, puncture under sonography guidance the popliteal vein where the thrombus is and suck out the thrombus. Uh, you create a channel. So, and then whatever clot is remaining, then you start them on oral, uh, sorry, uh, thrombolysis, like a RTPA, actylize, or you can give them streptokinase, urokinase, over 24 hours. And then you do a check venogram, where if the channel is completely, most of the time the channel is completely recanalized. And then below knee, for the below knee DVT, because you cannot go into the uh, posterior tibial vein and the anterior tibial vein, you need to give them oral anticoagulants for three months. Then you remove the filter. These are filters are removable filters. You remove the filter after three months. In which patient would you be aggressive like this? Any young patient. Uh, so nowadays, uh, if most of the patients we offer uh, intervention, whether patient is a 35 year old or a patient is a 75 year old, we offer them this because number one, the risk of pulmonary thromboembolism reduces significantly. Plus, uh, they are, the swelling reduces, so their lifestyle, their life, they can come back to normal life very fast. So, I'll just repeat what he said because almost none of us have ever referred a DVT immediately for an interventional procedure, right? And therefore, whether we should and what are the advantages. A patient comes to you with DVT, there are two problems. One we know, pulmonary embolism. The second is post-thrombotic syndrome. Post-thrombotic syndrome means that the veins are blocked, they will take months to recanalize and in those months the venous drainage is poor so the patient will get uh, edema. So these two problems can be prevented by immediate recanalization rather than waiting for the body itself to recanalize the veins. The immediate recanalization is through thrombectomy or thrombosuction. If there is a suppose a popliteal vein or a calf thrombosis, they will go through the popliteal vein and suck out the thrombus. When they suck out the thrombus, there is a risk that the thrombus will be displaced and will go into the lungs during the procedure. To prevent that from going into the lungs during the procedure, they will put an IVC filter. An IVC filter is an umbrella-like uh, structure, mesh which will go into the inferior vena cava when he said infrarenal, meaning after the renal veins, below the renal vein drainage into the IVC, you will put the filter, which is a temporary device, and that filter will catch any emboli which happened during the procedure. And after you do a thrombectomy, after a certain period of time, you will remove the filter. When will you remove the filter? Within three months. Within three months, you will remove the filter after the, after the thrombectomy. As he said, you will do the major thrombectomy. There will be some thrombus left behind and that will be managed by oral anticoagulants, whichever you choose. Uh, so, if a patient comes to you, the best results are achieved for venous thrombolysis within the first 14 days. The, matlab, you can intervene in a venous thrombosis for the first 14 days, an arterial first 48 hours. So it's like two days, two weeks. So for arterial, two days. First, if you want excellent result, no gangrene, no uh, ischemia, anything, first two days if you intervene, then you get excellent result. Similarly for a vein, first two weeks. Okay. What are the problems? Why don't we, why have we not been asking for a intervention in DVT? Is it because of lack of knowledge or fear of complications? 
no so complications are not much in no. these procedure there is obviously when we give at uh, like if a stroke patient comes they give rtp you know so it's like the same thing they give intravenous rtp we give uh, along the thrombus load rtp so risk of bleeding is there but uh, either there is there will be hematuria hematomasis hematochezia or wherever where, where from the sheath what we introduce perisheath ooze you know but that they stop immediately one less than 1% risk of intracranial bleed but touch wood till date not seen a single uh, if you and we monitor the aptt ptt pti and are every 6 hourly and according to that we adjust the heparin and the actualized dosages so if you are doing this uh, practice regularly then the risk of bleeding becomes less than 1% i would say uh, and, uh, and second important thing sorry. is the cost of the procedure it's an expensive procedure that is where uh, we cannot matlab, most patients have to be un made un understood that it's an expensive procedure but the results are excellent third matlab today if the patient comes to the institute we do it on the same day next day 24 hours we do a check we know in the evening patient is made is mobilized for third day or fourth day patient goes on walking and after that you give them class one compression stockings the leg over the next three months both the legs will become same whereas with if you give them oral anticoagulants there will always be a complaint ke pair mein bahut sujan hai lifestyle limiting things so all those things make a lot of difference okay. what is the cost average so an ivc filter will cost 70000 rupees and when you give rt actilize that, that is the most potent drug that we use it is 50000 rupees so for doing an ivc filter plus a catheter directed thrombolysis plus the hospital stay icu blood in everything thus it cost around 3 to 3.25 lakhs you are saying thrombolysis will be done intra arterially intravenous oh, what sorry. intra arterial intravenous uh, and you will also be sucking out the thrombus yes. from first the first is we suck out the thrombus then you put the uh, thrombolytic yes so it's like if you have uh, dirt you know barish mein kichad ho gaya to agar kichad ko saaf karna hai na to pehle wo jhadu se saaf karo and then you pani maro correct waisa hai so jhadu se marna is like suctioning and then pani marna is the thrombolysis so the total cost may go up to 3 lakhs 3 lakhs 3 lakhs okay okay so that is uh, any questions on in, patients, you for in dvt in so belloni uh, if that is a belloni thrombus arterial like, na arterial dvt dvt belloni uh, dvt popliteal tibials then only medical management up to sfa medical management if there is a common femoral vein, common iliac vein, IVC, then those patients absolutely, I think, we should offer them uh, intervention procedures. So up to popliteal vein, you are okay? Yeah, we don't because we puncture the popliteal vein. So we are not going to go below that and suck out that clots. So those patients, we treat them medically. Give them compression stockings, oral anticoagulants. They should respond beautifully. Correct. So I, I'm, I'm sorry, basics. Uh, you are saying above the popliteal vein you want to remove the thrombus. Yes. But if there is a thrombus above the popliteal vein, won't it be extending down? Huh. So th downwards, that is what I am saying. Popliteal vein. So in vein, no, we say distally. It's distally, never yeah, proximal. Sorry, no, no, sorry. So if like when I say popliteal vein thrombus, that means there is thrombus in the ATV, PTV. Okay. So popliteal vein and belloni, if belloni DVT, medical treatment. Up to mid superficial femoral vein medical management because they will not be that symptomatic only mm -hmm. they will come to you ke thoda sujan hai, very minimal it's not like they will have like a tense leg so those patients you can treat medically it, in your clinic give them clexin for five days seven days and then you give them oral anticoagulants for three months repeat a doppler after three months see whether the thrombus has dissolved or not whether you need to continue the anticoagulant for another three months and if they have repeated dvt then obviously they need to see a, a hemat uh, to find out what is the exact cause, cause of DVT. re recurrent DVTs. Correct. It's not Clexin. They are using tenectiplase or altiplase. No, 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 Clexin. Actilize. Intra intravenous actilize. But it's an anticoagulant. It will work in both artery as well as vein. So, heparin, act Clexin is basically you give, it's heparin. In the injection is heparin, so it is an anticoagulant, but actilized streptokinase, they are more Thrombolytic. potent. Thrombolytic. Thrombolytic drugs. BD, subcutaneously. In a 60 kg. 
No, no, no. For clicks, then you don't need to repeat. Yeah, yeah. Now, uh, just if you all… Just yeah, please, please continue. Uh, if there is a patient, now if the patient has undergone a knee replacement and uh, post that patient develops DVT. So, thrombolysis is contraindicated in any patients who has recent knee, sur any bone surgery, intracranial surgery for three months. Now, in these patients, if you give them Clexane and you, you still don't want, if you still want to offer, now there are newer uh, catheters like Enjojet, where we give, we, we give them uh, Actilize, like one third the dose uh, on table and we suck out the entire clot and you get on table result. There is no ICU stay required, uh, no risk of bleeding because whatever you are giving, you keep it for half an hour and within half an hour, you suck out the entire thrombus load. Patient comes from the ward, goes back to the ward. Expense is a factor. It's uh, the AngioJet catheter is 1.5 lakhs. No, sir. RTPA. So it's a recombinant tissue at plasminoantinogen and it is basically any clots it can dissolve any clots okay uh, uh, arterial peripheral vascular disease he said you have a window of two days two days uh, and any acute embolic phenomenon yes when you're saying in the lower limbs for example you have a window of two days so you have to diagnose quickly what is the common presentation how do they acute diagnose pain. this patient is a vein patient will be, will, will first, they will always say saat din se pair mein sujan hai. Artery is, subay se pair mein itna dard hai, ke I cannot keep my leg down. Ischemic pain is worst pain. Any kind of ischemia is worst, arterial ischemia. So they will, they will come to your clinic, either limping, they will come with support, they cannot put weight on that leg. And uh, how much ever delay, it will cause numbness. So basically motor sensory involvement is the first thing that you have to see when a patient walks into your clinic. If there is motor sensory involvement, the chances of uh, patient reversing becomes lower and lower. So that is where you have to act really fast. DVT, there is no motor sensory involvement. They will only come with swelling and tightness of the leg or maybe some blisters or something. But arterial is non-forgiving. So what kind of situation do you see commonly? Elderly patients who have embolism? Uh, diabetic. So obviously diabetic, uncontrolled sugars. Uh, there is obviously there is some atherosclerotic changes. So we, most of the time when we see arterial thrombus, it's acute on chronic. There was an underlying narrowing. Uh, there was a 60-70% stenosis. And in these patients, because of sugar, we, uh, extra sugar levels, and when they come, their sugar levels are 350, 450, and they will have a acute thrombus. So immediately what you do is you, you don't wait, Matlab, you don't even wait for uh, if they come in the night, in the next one hour is when you should immediately start the procedure. And what is the procedure? Same, thrombolysis. We do a suctioning, we do a, uh, we leave a infusion catheter in the thrombus load and start the drug, RTPA. And uh, do you stand this later? Yeah, so if there is an underlying narrowing, then that, that needs to be stented. It's an next elective day. procedure next, later. Next day, next, next day, day when, day when the, the thrombus stent. load is completely dissolved. Because initially if you, there is muck, there is thrombus. So if you expand a stent over there, then there is chances that the muck might go down and it can further cause uh, thrombuses. So you first dissolve the thrombus and then you stent the next. So that is another, uh, another, uh, sorry. I said first thing what I said when a patient comes to your clinic, feel the peripheral pulses. Most important, femoral, popliteal, pe uh, posterior tibial, dorsal spedis, four pulses. If you feel, that means you are sorted with the arterial system. Okay, we go to the next topic, uh, what he calls his bread and butter uh, areas, uh, which is image guided biopsies of suspected tuberculosis or malignancy. and. Uh, we, we, have all, we all know about lymph node biopsies from the neck, etc. Now, if there is a mediastinal lymph node, for example, to be biopsied, there are two or three ways to biopsy a mediastinal lymph node, CT-guided or endobronchial-guided uh, biopsy. So, uh, tell us something about mediastinal or lung biopsies that you do, commonest indications. Uh, 
so pro mic facility any Sorry. any lung lesion uh, if you don't have a tissue diagnosis you need to have some tissue diagnosis uh, to start the next step so we do ct guided uh, we for me i do biopsies even 1 cm nodules also if there is a so yesterday i did a biopsy in a 22 year old female uh, multiple 1 cm nodules in the lung yeah in the lung and uh, uh, it the patient came to me from a uro uh, onco surgeon so the, he was suspecting malignancy in a 22 the pet ct was done uh, but PET CT uh, didn't show any primary anywhere and even if there is a primary you need to prove that the lung thing in a 22 year old girl is whether it is malignancy or most commonly Cox in Indian in our scenario. So you do a biopsy CT guided and you send it for histopathology as well as for AFB culture gene expert MGI TV and uh, aerobic cultures. You can as little as one centimeter, one centimeter you can yes. reach. Yeah, yeah. So uh, with uh, latest machines and all, you get good recon, recon, re, uh, sorry. No, EBUS I don't do. So uh, let me finish. I'll come back to EBUS. So uh, with latest CTs where you have 64 slice, 128, 256 slice, the recon reconstruction images are very fine. So it helps us to reach the lesion much better. Uh, biopsy needles, so our biopsy needles are coaxial. So it's not like a, every time you cut a tissue, you have to go in. So there is a needle which you place within the lesion first and then there is an extra gun. With that gun you keep cutting tissues, how many ever tissues you want. Okay. So it's, so now the technology is improved significantly. Coming back to EBUS, so in EBUS what they do is, it is an endobronchial ultrasound guided. So it's like they, if there is a hilar lesion and uh, very close to pulmonary art, uh, artery or anything, major structures, then they will, endo, uh, through the bronchus, they will go inside and they will pluck it. But that needle is a finer needle. Our needle is 18 gauge, 16 gauge is the outer needle through which we use a 18 gauge needle. So we get proper pieces, like if you see the pieces, they will look like rice pieces, proper rice pieces and that to 2 to centimeters. If lesion is small then agreed but if a lesion is 3 centimeters you can get proper 2 centimeters and you can take multiple cores and then once you do it then they can process the thing. So on 3 days back same hilar lesion very complex patient came from uh, north I said ki EBUS would be a better option. Now the onco oncologist called me saying that EBUS se ho gaya, tissue diagnosis aa gaya, e adeno C, e IHC is done. But now for further test, I don't have tissue. So then it becomes tricky. So that way, if a CT guided or a sono guided biopsy is done, that is more definitive than an EBUS. Because the needle is fine with EBUS. No, these are true cut biopsies. We call it true cut. True cut biopsies. Not fine needle aspiration. Not fine needle aspiration. Big chunk. Yes, yes. No, 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 no. So you don't need no. to do all, you don't need to hit all the lung lesions. You just hit one of the most typical. So now people have started the oncology. Uh, so what are the areas from which you can biopsy? In the solid organs, where can you biopsy? So uh, below neck, any lymph nodes, uh, lung biopsies, uh, sub subcarinal, mediastinal, hilar lymph nodes or mass, any we can biopsy. Uh, abdominal, liver lesions, splenic lesions, uh, pancreatic. bowel, pancreas, pancreatic lesions. Uh, hollow organs? Ba hollow organs, bowel also, if there is a, a exophytic large mass, then you can take it from the large mass. Uh, any bone biopsies, spine. Uh, vertebral biopsies, femur, humerus, any bio bone biopsy. There is a, a special gun for it where you just need remove a big, big piece of bone from it. And he did a myocardial biopsy, biopsy also. Yes, yes, I was yes. surprised to know that you can do myocardial biopsies mm -hmm. with a true cut needle. And yeah, that is. Yeah, I have done a uh, right atrial myxoma biopsy also. So we yeah. went through the jugular vein and then. Through that, uh, we go inside and we did a biopsy from the right atrial myxoma. Oh. And so in that also, there are, uh, if a patient like liver lesion, simple cirrhotic patients, no lesion, but 
a gastroenterologist will require some liver tissue to find out what is the exact cause. Now, the biggest risk of any biopsy for liver is bleeding because when, or kidney is bleeding. When you breach the capsule, the capsule breach causes a lot of bleeding. And if there is ascites, refractory ascites, then patient will just keep bleeding like a tap in the ascitic fluid. What you do is you do a transjugular liver biopsy. So you don't breach. So it is done through the hepatic veins. You take a chunk from the liver parenchyma and we can do a transjugular liver biopsy with platelet counts of even 15,000. Oh, wow. Okay. So that is the advantage. Local. Only local anesthesia, no sedation. Even for a 12-year-old child, we've done biopsies under low. It's just basic counseling, telling them. Pericardial, if there is thickening, plural, plural based nodules. Sir, if there is a lesion, and if there is access, we, I will, we'll do a biopsy from it. There is no, no, we can do a biopsy from it. There is no way we cannot do a biopsy. I have done uh, trans-oral biopsies also, but that obviously under GA. But uh, the uh, C1 vertebra, there was a lesion. So we went through a trans -holer. Investigation, CBC and PTINR. If the patient is on any blood thinners, then you stop the anticoagulants for three days. Prostate biopsies. We do prostate, but transrect prostate biopsies also. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, a routine CT guided biopsy in our setup would cost around 18,000 rupees. Testing is always separate because that depends where the oncologist or the onco surgeon wants to send it. How many tests? Immunology How many tests? Test and uh, if you send it to Raheja, a biopsy will cost 6,000, histopathology will cost 6,500. Whereas to send it to a, a, another pathology, he might do it for 2,000 rupees. So, 20,000, 20, yes. And a daycare procedure, Matlab, you walk in pro OPD based procedure. You come, do the procedure, and you go home. Simple. The risk obviously are there of pneumohemothorax, but then you explain them. So, generally, that risk is also very min minimal. Okay, we go on to the next uh, area, and that is about oncology. Uh, therapeutic maneuvers in oncology with invasive methods? So, uh, as an intervention radiologist, we in oncology, our main area, b favorite organ is liver. So, we do a lot of liver direct therapies. Uh, obviously, if post uh, any tumor, patient has bleeder, bleeding, like GI bleed or intra-abdominal bleed, then we do embolizations for that, just to block the blood supply to that area. But otherwise, liver directed treatment, so if there is a liver lesion, maybe HCC, the first thing is diagnosis. So if there is a liver lesion less than 2 centimeter, AFP more than 200, and a CT or an MRI picture showing arterial enhancement with washer, you don't even need to biopsy that lesion. It's proven it is HCC. Proven. You don't need to, do, don't need to needle that lesion. We Either just ex explain this again. Liver lesion more than 2 centimeters, less than, two less than uh, alpha fetoprotein more than, than 200. 200. And, and any one imaging, either CT or MRI, showing, uh, so when you say, when you do a, a CT, they do it in three phases, arterial, triple phase, arterial, portal and venous. So if there is on arterial, if the lesion lights up before the rest of the liver and on the venous phase, the lesion drains and the, the liver is still lighting up. That means there is an arterial enhancement and a venous washout. That means this lesion are HCCs. Malignant. Malignant. Like so, uh, okay. And you uh, don't need to biopsy this lesion. So for lesions who are 3 centimeters, single lesion 3 centimeters, single lesion 5 centimeters, or 3 lesions up to 3 centimeters, you can RFA them, radio frequency. So you put in a needle and you burn the liver, the lesion equivalent to surgical results. Patient becomes disease free. If, if these lesions are difficult to percutaneous approach, you can obviously do an intraoperative or offer them chemoembolizations where you, we do, that's an arterial procedure, intra-arterial procedure. You go up to the liver lesion and block the blood supply. First is give them chemo. So what we use is we use lipidol oil, which is a poppy seed oil and make an emulsion with cisplatin and doxorubicin and you inject it intra, intralesional through the arterial route. Uh, why lipidol? 
so normal liver has kaffir cells and an hcc does not have kaffir cells and for lipidol excretion you need kaffir cells so that lipidol will stay inside the lesion and you made an emulsion with a chemo drug so it will cause a slow sustained release of the chemo drug over the next two months plus you block the blood supply so it will cause necrosis and shrinkage of the tube so uh, again i'll just repeat he is talking about therapeutic sort of chemo embolization of tumors of a particular size uh, are you saying with curative intent or as a bridge to transplant so rfa is curative it is as i said it is equivalent to surgery but chemo embolization is a it, it is a palliative procedure but if if there is a, a, a lesion which is 7 cm so patient doesn't fall into the transplant category so you shrink them make this tissue dead by giving by doing a chemo embolization and when you do it patient automatically becomes eligible for transplant or resection or whatever so a uh, radio frequency uh, uh, ablation up to a particular size or numbers curative intent with carcinoma hcc and larger lesions chemo embolization with uh, intent to be a bridge towards transplant yeah so uh, just uh, a normal liver has two blood sub two two ways of blood supply uh, mike thodu mike a uh, normal liver will have two two ways of blood supply normal liver 80% of the liver is supplied by portal vein 20% supplied by hepatic artery a liver tumor 80% is supplied by the hepatic artery 20% by the portal vein so when you do chemo embolization you are actually closing the 80% blood supply of the liver tumor but the portal vein has to be normal if the portal vein is not normal then you cannot offer them chemo embolization because you are closing the hepatic artery and already the portal vein there is a tumor thrombus so in such patients we can offer them radio embolization so uh, when we give a uh, chemo embolization the emboli which we use the size of that particles are around somewhere between 500 to 1000 microns but in radio embolization the particle size is 20 30 microns so it will never close the hepatic artery these beads are loaded with uh, a drug which is yttrium 90 and it will cause slow steady radiation on the liver tumor and cause shrinkage a uh, little expensive procedure in india radio embolization is done less the drug is not made in india the y90 comes from either from singapore or australia so you have to do a study first see calculate the dosage then you order for the drug the drug comes in the patient's name only and and then you have to inject it in that particular time because you have you have calculated that i need to inject this much drug so these drugs are radioactive drugs so these are have a half life so they will say that on this particular day at this particular time you have to inject okay uh, i think we'll go ahead for the next you also do aspirations therapeutic aspiration like pleural tap for example is very simple yeah amoebic liver abscess how how and when do you tap an amoebic liver abscess so if the uh, obviously ultrasound number one thing is you do an sonography if it's a liquefied le- around 50 cm 50 cc collection then you don't tap them but around 150 200 cc patient is having persistent fever even with one week of antibiotics then you need to get out the source so you just put in a needle and aspirate if the if the abscess is really big like 300 400 so then what you do and it is partially liquefied then you put in a catheter a pictil catheter and you leave it so initially it will drain 150 200 but as the antibiotics work on it and as it liquefies it will further keep draining so just explain again what is a pictil so pictil is like a, a, a you all know an icd catheter for thorax if there is a hemonymo your an icd catheter is around 24 20 20 20 to 24 french we use a pictil which is around 10 12 14 french and it and the tip of the catheter is like a pig tail so it chances of it pulling out are very minimal so uh, you uh, put a catheter connected to a collecting bag or a urine bag and it will keep coming out so pig tail catheter is typically used in amoebic abscess which is partially liquefied large and you put in the pig tail keep it attached to a drain and uh, 
yeah it over days it will probably drain the whole drain. abscess and then once it is drained completely you just remove it in an ambipicular abscess we should remember the indications of immediate drainage meaning without waiting for the antibiotics the major indication is a 10 cm abscess in the left lobe this is a must to be drained you cannot wait for a large abscess in the left lobe because that can puncture into the pericardium and otherwise as he said if you are given a flagyl metronidazole for some days and there is no relief in fever some people keep 72 hours as the criterion 3 days of uh, metronidazole no response in fever you drain the abscess if it is liquefied of course if it is not liquefied you will have to wait further uh, yeah I think uh, any questions here? I have one more area to cover, but if you have any questions. No. So if uh, there are filters, but they are acutely used, Malab, if there is a uh, prog there is a thrombus in the superficial femoral artery. So you can use a filter that when you are doing the suctioning you put a filter down so the filter the thrombus doesn't go down but very rarely used. So uh, coming to arterial I just want to add one thing. So when we say peripheral angiographies and peripheral angioplasties or stenti the aim is if a patient is having rest pain to reduce the rest pain. If the patient has claudication to improve his walking distance. If the patient has a non-healing ulcer or a wound, to heal the wound. And if a patient has gangrene, to reduce the level of gangrene. So when we do peripheral angiographies, angioplasties, it is with this intention that we Darkness, do the yeah. procedures. Reduce the level of amputation, he said, if there is gangrene. We go up to the dorsalis pedis, up to the entire arch also. Now we have balloons which are 1.5 uh, millimeters and you have long balloons. So, and you have tapering balloons also. So distal end is 2 millimeters, proximal is 2.5, 220 millimeters, 20 to 20 meters. So the entire track can be dilated. We don't put stents in the below knee region. We generally only balloon dilate the below knee, tibials. Uh, the last, uh, sorry, so both. common he should be asking us <laughs> <laughs> very difficult to say huh. very less sir but sorry sir severe hemoptysis intervention for severe hemoptysis. hemoptysis so if a patient comes with severe hemoptysis first thing is you get a ct ch chest done uh, if the patient has a big cavitating lesion or a fungal ball with uh, fluid fluid level that means the patient has bled within the the cavity these patient uh, with bronchiectasis that means the lung is bad so these patients you need to offer them bronchial artery embolizations and obviously the quantity of the hemoptysis you ask them ek chamach ek vati ek glass kitna vomit hua blood ka so one spoon you can still conserve but if recurrent one day he will have a large bout so if there is a patient who has recurrent one spoon hemoptysis, you electively block the bronchial arteries like that. And then the CT findings will obviously tell us what needs to be done. Can you suggest any, uh, sorry. Sir, uh, as I first said, okay, gangrene, if there is gangrene, then you only intervene for reducing the level of gang. So what is dead will come out. If that portion has healed, then you don't do any intervention unless and until the patient has rest pain or claudication. If there is wound has healed, then you don't intervene. So that means the patient is still having uh, the so then revascularization you need to do because if after amputation also if that the bed of the ulcer bed is not healing and there is still blackening then you need to improve the blood supply before the surgeon amputes it further. The last area the commonest uh, malignancy that all of us see one of the commonest at least is the uh, breast malignancy a breast lump is often uh, the presentation to you and uh, suspicious if you are it is suspicious malignancy you will order a biopsy uh, after a mammogram so uh, 
two, three things here. Is a mammogram mandatory if there is an obvious lump before you biopsy? Yes, to what, why? look for any micro calcifications or macro calcification. So, a mammosonomammo is absolutely mandatory. If there is micro calcification, how does your biopsy decision change? Or if there is no micro calcification, how does your biopsy decision change? Uh, no, so if there is micro calcification, the surgeon will take a call whether uh, they want to first start a new adjuvant chemotherapy and then do a biopsy okay. like that because micro calcification generally they say so biopsy may not be done even before, before starting, starting a, a chemo new adjuvant chemo. therapy okay. depends on the symptoms and everything Correct. but yes what we can do is we can localize that lesion if there is certain lesions where uh, the, the surgeon feels that they respond beautifully to any chemo new adjuvant chemo then we put a clip inside the lesion in that area in the center of the lesion so if the the lesion completely responds and still the surgeon wants to do now you get breast uh, conserves reserve uh, the lumpectomy onco or, or mm -hmm. whatever they say it so there you put a clip so they remove one centimeter all along the clip area so we do sono guided clip localization of the lesion also i don't know this anybody knows this can I explain better can you explain this better but i did not understand the clip thing so if there is a lesion Okay, and okay, you biopsy the lesion and now uh, this, uh, you send the biopsy for all the histopathology and you start the patient on uh, chemo, neoadjuvant chemo. Neoadjuvant is basically before any surgery. Uh, adjuvant chemo is after surgery. So, if before surgery, neoadjuvant, after surgery, adjuvant chemotherapy. So, if the surgeon feels that if we give neoadjuvant chemotherapy and the lesion will dissolve completely, but still you need to remove that tissue. It, it, it is difficult for them to palpate. Even if they call us intraoperatively for localization, at times it becomes difficult for us. Because, because it is completely shrink, shrunk, the, the lesion is gone. Yes, so we put a metallic clip there, sono guided in the center of the lesion. Before the new adjuvant chemotherapy yes. started. Before the adju new adjuvant chemotherapy started. So even if the lesion shrinks completely, you know that this was the place where the lesion is there. And then remove that clip from there. Yes. Correct. So they would want to remove that area to yes. prevent recurrence. Got it. Uh, about the biopsy, the procedure, the breast biopsy procedure. Again, the true cut biopsy, FNAC is not done anymore. No, no. Yeah. FNAC. So, uh, where do you do it? What guidance? So, no guided biopsy under local anesthesia. Okay. And breast tissue generally don't bleed. So, it's not like you need to stop any anticoagulants or, you know, it's just a straightforward, simple procedure under Sono guidance, like any other Correct. biopsy. Right. Uh, last question about from my side. All these biopsies, ultrasound, CT guided biopsies, you put in needle, you are removing tissue. Is there a chance of seeding the malignant cells across the tract? No. There is no, no, no such thing described or there is a rare possibility? Rare possibility, yes, but I don't see, uh, I have not seen any uh, seeding uh, malignancy. Malignancy. No, no seeding. Seeding means all along the along tract. Along the tract, you get malignancy, tissue. whether, whether there is something that is seen. If it was there, then maybe biopsy was, would never exist only. <laughs> yeah, that is true. <laughs> so, biopsy is the, the standard. See, there are either excision biopsy, there is true cut biopsy, and there is fine needle aspiration cytology, FNAC. So, uh, surgeons would say, we, know, we need the entire tissue. So, if you are suspecting lymphoma, then they need to do a lot of, a battery of tests. So, for that, maybe an excision biopsy would be useful. But these lesions sometimes are difficult to access. There is some major blood vessel all along it. So, for those, we can do a true cut biopsy. And if lesion is less than a centimeter, but still, like, uh, if there is a patient who's had a surgery and uh, post-surgery, everything is fine, Three months follow-up shows one small, less than a centimeter node, lymph node in the neck and which is showing uptake. Uh, that is whether it is a reactive lymph node or whether it is a malignant lymph node. If you bi can biopsy it, 
always biopsy. But if you cannot biopsy, at least do a fine needle aspiration, FNAC. Make slides and the pathologist will lead them under a microscope. That is what I'm saying, ma'am. It depends on what pathology. If it's if you're in a young patient, if you're suspecting cox and all, then then you do a true cut biopsy. But if you if you are suspecting lymphoma or anything, then a full lymph node would be always better. Uh, FNAC has almost been given up yes. for cervical Absolutely. lymph nodes. For example, our commonest lymph nodes are cervical, cervical lymph nodes, and we often think of doing FNAC for tuberculosis, whatever. Given up. So do not order FNAC for suspected tuberculosis or lymphoma in cervical lymph nodes. Do only a true cut, cut biopsy, biopsy or incisional biopsy and send it for whatever you have to send it for, MGIT, culture, uh, uh, gene expert. Fibroids, yes. Uh, so that He's asking about therapy of uterine fibroids, non-surgical. Non-surgical. So now we've... Uh, in, so basically what the idea is that you block the blood supply and once you block the blood supply that tissue goes into necrosis and shrinkage, fibrosis. It fibrosis the entire area. So uh, we go to any fib uh, if there are multiple uterine fibroids, you go as distal to the blood supply of the uterine fibroid and you block them. Uh, you can block uh, n number of fibroids criteria is basically if less than 9 centimeters with more than 9 centimeters then a surgical intervention would be advised or any pedunculated uh, fibroid so if the patient has a pedunculated fibroid which is like outside you know hanging then those uh, fibroids you should not embolize because they will necrose and they will fall in the peritoneal cavity so they can cause infection Similarly, we do prostatic artery embolization. That is also a newer thing that we have started, prostatic artery embolization. Newer developments that are coming are uh, embolization for frozen shoulder and osteoarthritis also. Osteoarthritis, <laughs> yeah. Wow. Genuculate artery embolization, yes. So basically, you block the blood supply. So if there is any calcium uh, tendonitis, calcification, so they all reduce significantly. And then you do physiotherapy, so that calcification is gone. No, sir. So we don't go as distal. So when we say block the blood supply is more proximal. Necrosis will happen if you block the micro vessels. Micro channels, if you block, then they will cause necrosis. Like that. And necrosis, if you say it's, n we never block the blood supply for the skin. It's only around the tendon. And tendon, when you block, generally it will pull the blood from somewhere else. But inflammation and all that will reduce significantly so you can start your physiotherapy will reduce yes sir slowly steadily yes knee joint geniculate artery embolization so uh, not commonly done bombay mumbai nobody does it uh, one of my colleague in ahmedabad he started it and there are good response to it Patients who are non-surgical candidates, uh, inoperable, so for them, pain relief and uh, at least their lifestyle improves significantly. I think we'll, uh, we'll stop here and uh, <laughs> uh, congratulate him, please, on wonderful uh, Thank talk. you. Thank you very much. Thank you. So this is from all of us. Thank you so much.